Hello, everyone. Welcome to Classroom Tutorial Live for Saturday, June the 10th. Today's topic is our featured teacher or librarian. Our special guest is Nikki Robertson. Your show hosts are Peggy George. I'm Lori Moffat, Tammy Moore, and Paula Noggle. Thanks to Tammy for doing closed captioning for us. And I'm going to turn the mic over to Susie Higley, who will now introduce Nikki and also ask her the newbie question. All right. It is so exciting to have Nikki with us today. As somebody who came to librarianship as kind of my second teaching career, it's people like Nikki that made it so much easier for me. She's a pioneer in so many ways. and so many things that she started and been a part of. So she has things not just for librarians, but for anybody. She's going to share tips for new school librarians, but I think lots of us will learn from that. She's a veteran educator, librarian, technology facilitator, ISTE librarian network president-elect. She's passionate about one-to-one -one digital initiatives, collaboration. Uh, she was an early adopter of Periscope and sharing things, co-founder of EdCamp Atlanta, and I could go on and on and on, but she is a true pioneer in so many different ways and so enthusiastic. So I'm very, very pleased to introduce her and the newbie question. What does Web 2.0 mean to you, and why do you use Web 2.0 tools in your library school? I'll let you go ahead and answer that, Nikki, and then the floor is yours. <laughs> okay. So what does Web 2.0 mean to you, and why do you use Web 2.0 tools in your library and school? Well, you know, number one, that's where our kids are, and we need to meet our kids where they are, and I think you'll kind of see that as kind of my theme for our five tips for new school librarians and those who aren't so new today. Um, but if everything we're doing isn't about the kids and centered on the kids, then we've got to go back and re-examine why we are doing it. So I have so many slides in here today. I always have so much more to share than I have time to share. So we're going to jump in and get started with, with this, if that's OK. So I hope we're all good. OK. So, and I see chats going on. Absolutely, Nikki. All right. So we're going to talk about five tips for new school librarians. So those of you who are new school librarians and who, who are joining us today, congratulations on your new job as a school librarian. And for those of you who are experienced librarians, you might support this next statement. Um, I say that it's hands down the absolutely best job ever that you can have in a school. I mean, there is no other place that is amazing and fun and lets you be as creative as the school library setting. So I, I love being a school librarian. So we're going to jump into some five tips. All right, our very first tip is to connect, 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 because being a school librarian can be a shockingly isolating profession, especially after you've been a classroom teacher and you're used to having that close supportive network of your classroom teacher friends. You're all in that together. You're all classroom teachers. But then once you become a school library, you're in this sort of no man's land. You're not part of a teacher peer group anymore. You're not part of the administrative peer group. And often, you're the only person in your school that works in the library or understands what it takes to run an active, engaging, supportive library. Many school districts, unfortunately, often perpetuate, per, uh, perpetuate <laughs> this isolation by not allowing time for district librarians to meet and plan collaborative, collaboratively, which only exacerbates that isolation. And it's really weird how you can go from being a classroom teacher and accepted in that peer group to suddenly, even if you're in the same school, you're connected, but you're not in the same peer group with the people. So oops, I know I'm trying to use my arrow button. So the first thing I suggest that you do, especially those of you that are new in libraries or you're not so new, but you're you feel isolated, you might be feeling isolated. I see Susie saying, yes, it's culture shock. <laughs> I agree. Is find your people. So don't wait, wait around for your district to connect you and have like those monthly district meetings with librarians that some do. 
but go ahead and reach out to the other librarians in your district. Find out what you have in common. If your kids play softball or do dance or gymnastics or whatever, see if they do go to the same place. See if you can't, you know, have play dates with each other. Of course, my kids are all grown up, so my favorite thing is to see if we can go out to brunch or lunch on the weekends or maybe have an after-school dinner meeting. And it's fun sometimes to just get together with the people in your district who really get you, who can understand your complaints about the library, because we all have complaints, even though it's the best place in the world. And it's a place where you can just unwind and connect with each other and swap ideas and, and share your plans. But then don't stop there. Make sure that you connect with librarians outside of your school, district, state, and country because that brings a unique worldview into your library program and when you do that, it enriches student learning. So I really liked the poll that we took at the beginning because we found out there's pretty much a half and half here in the room where half of us um, or on Twitter or participated in Twitter chats and half of us haven't. So I'm going to encourage you to do that. Twitter is one of the best places you can go to connect, share, learn, and grow with other school librarians and connected educators. Twitter is how I went from being a burned out educator to feeling like I never wanted to do anything else but teach for the rest of my life. Um, Twitter did that for me. Teaching before Twitter was lonely, it was frustrating, it was boring, and teaching with Twitter is energizing, invigorating, fun, creative, and I never want to get off this ride of bringing awesome learning opportunities to my students and teachers. So here's a few secrets for tr truly harnessing the power of Twitter, because it took me a while. I got a Twitter account and was like, nothing's happening, and that's because I didn't know the magic that you have to know to work Twitter. So one of the magic secrets that you have to know is about hashtags, harnessing your hashtags to um, enhance your Twitter experience. So by following, commenting, sharing, and connecting using hashtags, you'll maximize your own professional learning. So three hashtags that I like to use in addition to our live classroom 2.0. <laughs> Um, our TL chat, which stands for Teacher Librarian Chat, ISTE Lib, um, so if you're interested or know anything about ISTE or going to ISTE this summer, um, ISTE Lib is one to follow as well because it's where your um, ISTE connected librarians are. And then uh, the newest one is the Future Ready Libs, which is your Future Ready Librarians, which if you're not familiar with Future Ready, please make sure to get familiar with that. But then don't limit yourself just to those hashtags. Make sure to connect using your state education hashtags as well, because I like to participate in my Alabama Ed Chat, AL Ed Chat, because that's where our administrators are. And so the more that you can join in the conversation with administrators on Twitter as well, and not just in your own bubble of librarians, <laughs> the more our administrators are going to realize just how valuable librarians are to the entire school. I've had administrators comment on Twitter when I've joined the conversation on state chat saying, I had no idea librarians could do that. I didn't know that my librarian could solve this particular issue that I was having and discussing here on this Twitter chat. And so by being visible in those other hashtags and again, getting outside of our own bubble is um, going to help us keep our jobs as librarians in those tight budget crunch times, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Then, those are just hashtags to use, but then you need to talk and learn about Twitter chats. So with Twitter chats, that's a conversation that's either held weekly or monthly, mostly. It's in a Q&A format led by a moderator or moderators. And I don't think I can show this to you, but um, two places to go to find Twitter chats, of course, Cyberry Man, Jerry Blumengarten's site, Cyberry Man's educational hashtags is one place you could go to find those Twitter chats. And then another place I like to go is also participate learning chats. Participate learning chat shows you what chats are happening on what day, at what time, and then it also includes transcripts from past 
chats. And I like to go back through those transcripts to find the links and um, information that were shared during the chat so that then I can learn further from reading those blog posts or the article posts that people share during those chats as well. All right, Facebook. All right, I know a lot of us are on Facebook, but Facebook is a great place, and I saw people talking about that in the chat out of the corner of my eye, but Facebook is a great place to join groups. And a few of my favorite Facebook groups are um, Future Ready Librarians, the School Librarians Workshop, and Makerspaces in the Participatory Library, because a lot of libraries are moving on over to doing makerspaces now. But don't limit yourself to this. If you know of some others, then make sure to tweet out other connections, other hashtags, other groups that you like to use. If you know some, go ahead and put those into the chat over in the side box so that those can be put into the archive as well. Because part of this great, wonderful world of ours that we live in now, being able to connect like this, is that we can share with each other and learn from each other. So um, if you have any others you would add to this, please put that into the chat. All right, and then professional development. I like to use. Um, social media for professional development, like the professional development we're having today right here with Classroom 2.0 Live. And I believe Classroom 2.0 Live was one of the first professional development tools I came across on the internet when I was going from being a burned out librarian to changing and connecting. And it, I'm so glad that Classroom 2.0 has been around for me and around for all of you as well. There are some other opportunities for learning the TL Virtual Cafe webinar series, which is absolutely free and is a grassroots movement put together by librarians like you and me, um, not sponsored by anybody officially. It, it really was a, a grassroots movement to bring professional development specifically to librarians because if, if you think about it, a lot of us sit in professional development at our school that really have nothing at all to do with us as librarians. <laughs> and it's very hard to find specialized professional development for us. So we have that. Then there's the Future Ready Librarians webinars that have just started, and they are so good. Um, Steve Hargadon, who also helps sponsor Classroom 2.0 Live, helps with Library 2.0 webinar series. And also the ISTE Librarians Network Professional Development. All of those are some free online professional development resources that you can use to connect like we're connecting today. So um, don't limit yourself. The learning is out there if you're willing to search for it and find it. All right, tip number two. And you're thinking, wait a minute, I know she's a lot more than just two tips. So I'm kind of shoving stuff all together into tips. So. <laughs> Tip number two is be you. You are wonderful. When I first started becoming a connected educator, I thought it was going to be great. But little did I understand the feelings of inadequacy that would envelop me as I connected with and learned about all the amazing things other educators around the country and around the world were doing in their schools. And I became overwhelmed and I felt, oh gosh, there is no way I could possibly even come close to being as good as the rock star educators I was learning from. And it really, it floored me. It made me feel like I can't go on. I can't do this. And, but what I learned was that I had to be my own rock star. So early in my career as a school librarian, um, back in like 1997, 1998, I attended a BER seminar that featured Judy Freeman. And Judy Freeman, she played an instrument and she sang songs and she shared lesson ideas. And instead of focusing on the lesson ideas, I got taken away in the need to play an instrument and sing. Now, <laughs> here's the insane thing about that. And <laughs> You'll see this connection in a minute. I can't, I've never ever played an instrument in my entire life, and I can't carry a tune. I, I have no 
tune steering abilities whatsoever. I cannot sing. People will pay me not to sing. But I also have no rhythm. And I can completely relate to Steve Martin's character in the movie The Jerk when he has no rhythm. But eventually, Steve's character finds his own personal rhythm and is ready to take on the world. So what I encourage you to do is find your own personal rhythm. Don't worry about those rock stars. So I had to learn to deeply reflect and find what it was that I personally could bring to my profession that was uniquely me. What was my passion? The thing that made my feet tap, my fingers snap, and my heart sing. And I had to learn to stop comparing myself to this rock star librarian or that superstar teacher. Rather, I learned I should absorb all that I could from those I was connecting with and then see how I could tweak what I was learning to fit my own personal beat. And so that was the message I finally was able to take away. And what I wanted you to know is what makes a great rock star or superstar educator isn't their ability to sing, play an instrument, be a graphic design genius, make and, and entertain kids with puppets, the ability to build your own apps, or anything else. What makes a rock star or superstar educator is their willingness to completely step outside of their comfort zone and try something new without being forced by a school initiative to do it, <laughs> and their willingness to connect, share, learn, and grow with others. So you do you the best way that you can do. Okay, Learn from others, but then you do you. All right, three. The third point after I just said be you is it's not about you. <laughs> I know. What? So it's not about you, though. So many times when I talk with other school librarians or educators about new ideas that I've heard about, I often get the response back, but I don't like blah, 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 or I don't like blank. And my question in response is, have you asked your students what they would like? And that kind of stops people on their tracks because, no, they haven't asked their kids what they want. So as educators, it's easy to get set in our ways. It's nice to feel like the expert in your space. And anything that might change that paradigm can throw our whole world spinning into chaos, or at least that's how it can feel, right? The library, though, is a service industry. You as a librarian, you're there to serve the needs of your administration, teachers, students, and not your own agenda. So whether you're an elementary, middle, or high school librarian, whether you work on a fixed or flexible schedule, setting the right tone for the library in which all voices are heard is crucial to a successful, happy library. So first off, empower teacher voice. When you get in, li in the library, first thing you should do is find a way to empower that teacher voice. And I love this article that the amazing Jennifer Lagarde wrote. She wrote a post about her first day at a new school titled The Art of Listening. What Jennifer did was quick, easy, low-tech, and yet set the tone for the rest of the school year. She asked one question to which teachers responded on post-it notes. What would it take to make you see bringing students to the library as a good use of your instructional time? Jennifer didn't stop there. When those teachers left and left their post-it notes behind, she didn't file them in file 13. What she did is she reviewed each response thoughtfully and then set a plan into motion for the school year that would let her staff know that she not only heard but valued their input. And I'm hoping to do something just like that in my new career whenever I decide to stop being retired. <laughs> and the second thing I would say to do within this is empower student voice. Every single day, the more you can empower a student voice, do it. Empower, empower, empower. And when I think of the words empower student voice, it immediately brings to mind Andy Plemons, elementary school librarian at Barrow Elementary School in Georgia. Andy continuously 
empower student voice with his use of Flipgrid and connecting his library and teachers classes with other schools through Skype and Google Hangouts. One particular project where Andy empowers student voice is in the selection of books for the school library. A student book budget committee was formed under Andy's guidance. This group created a survey surveyed the school, analyzed the results, set goals, met with vendors, compiled wish list, cut list to match the budget, and helped order the books. This is all students doing this with Andy's guidance. The empowerment didn't end with the ordering of the books. The learning and involvement continued once the books arrived with students applying the barcode, spine labels, and label protectors. They checked the books off of the packing slips, they stamp them with a the library stamp, and you can read more about that on Andy Plemons uh, blog site underneath the book budget committee. And what I love about this particular activity from Andy were the real life connections that students saw in relation to their futures and future employment opportunities. One story Andy tells in, his, in this particular blog post is one young lady took it upon herself to um, display the new books and she also was talking with some of the vendors about displays and how to set up displays and she took that upon herself and said you know they might just need to give me a call when I graduate so I can work for them and so she was putting together what they were doing there with the books with her future and she was in envisioning her future and anytime we can get kids to envision their future is so extremely helpful. So I love that Andy not let his kids do every single part. They talked with vendors and they did the whole entire thing. It's just amazing to me and I want to do something. I, I'll, I always want to ch channel my inner Andy. Alright, so the next one, now that we've learned that it's not about you but be you, is to tell your story. I cannot tell you how important telling your story is. So, budget and personnel for school libraries are continuously targeted as schools grapple with declining budgets. In 2010, Shonda Briscoe created a collaborative Google map called A Nation Without School Libraries so that librarians around the globe could document cuts to school libraries. But what I want you to do, and this is a GIF, you'd see them all jumping up. It's if it was um, kind to guess. So we as school librarians need to change this narrative, the narrative of a nation without school libraries. And part of that is making our voice heard. So instead of simply documenting the decline of school libraries, our efforts would be better spent through celebrating the incredible learning that takes place in our libraries every single day. That's what I see about telling our stories is it's celebrating everything that happens. In fact, it's imperative to our very survival that we tell our stories so that when budget crunches come, and they will, the very thought of not having a school library with at least one certified school librarian would simply be unthinkable. So how can you tell your story? One way you can tell your story is through the use of social media. So harnessing the power of social media is one of the very important mediums we as, we as school librarians can use to tell our stories. Personally, here's the way that I use different social media sites. I see Facebook as a place to reach parents and grandparents. I see Twitter as the place where I can reach professional and educational connections. Instagram is for your tweens, teens, and some parents. And Snapchat is where, of course, your tweens and teens are. So posting information to this many different sites can seem taxing, but it can be simplified and streamlined with the help of a few social media tools. For instance, I love posting from Instagram because Instagram also gives you a choice to post the same exact thing to Facebook and Twitter, and it's just a matter of clicking a button. So then you kill three birds with one stone. Snapchat's my favorite new beast, having been at the high school library, and Snapchat's kind of a beast all of its own. But I usually, during the day in my library, I take all of my pictures or short 10 second or less videos with Snapchat first before anything else. 
I then share each picture or video in the form of a daily story. Now, Instagram and Facebook have also added in stories, but personally, I still like Snapchat stories the best, but that's me. That might not be your thing, so you go ahead and you do you, right, because that's our message, but you have to go where the kids are. The kids aren't going to be on Facebook, so if you're wanting to reach your teens and tweens, you're going to need to embrace some Snapchat because <laughs> that's where they are. That's how my kids at my high school knew about all the cool stuff going on in our makerspace, new books we had, et cetera. So after I did the Snapchat, I would then save those um, snaps or videos to my phone's camera roll, and then from there I would share out to other um, social media sites. Yeah, elementary level, there, Snapchat, but if you're in the high school and want to reach your kids, i got to go there. I still love Snapchat, and I use it with my grandchildren. Um, there's some silly stuff there on Snapchat, and so my grandchildren and I have made a point of taking silly pictures with Snapchat and sending them back and forth to each other. So, But I would definitely wouldn't encourage you to tell your elementary kids to get a Snapchat account. <laughs> we got to take care of our babies. So, um, some ways that I use Snapchat, and again, when I say Snapchat, I use Snapchat to take the post um, and post pictures every single day, um, but then I also use those pictures to share out through other social media posts. So, however you share those out is up to you, but here's a few ways that I use Snapchat or slash whatever social media you want to use. Um, this is what I like to do. I like to promote new books. I advertise library promotions like Poem in Your Pocket, Banned Books. I spotlight new robots, art supplies, Legos, and other things in our makerspace. I showcase student talent, um, music mixing, impromptu singing that might happen. In the library, we have kids who bring guitars in. I also like to celebrate great co-teaching lessons because you know, I want to show every aspect of how the library is helping in the school. So things like when we do breakout EDUs with teachers or I'm teaching about digital portfolios or however I'm doing co-teaching with my teachers. Um, I let followers know what's printing on our 3D printer that day. And then a bunch of selfies, groupies, and crazy Snapchat filters. Those are fun to do as well. So basically what I do is every morning or um, you could come in and whether it's Snapchat or something else that you're using, you can do a welcome message like, good morning, we're open and ready for business. And, and then at the end of the day, you can say, thanks for the most amazing day. See you again tomorrow. And in between, I fill the entire day with pictures of everything that is happening in our library because I want people to know every single day all the cool stuff that's happening in our library. Because if you've been a library for any time at all, You've had those people who've walked in in between classes right after you finish putting away the 200 books the last class just brought in <laughs> and say, oh, it must be so nice to work in the library where it's so quiet all the time and you just really want to reach across the desk and choke them, but you don't because you love them and you're not going to do that. So um, sharing what you're doing on social media helps to stop that, oh, it's always so quiet in here because if they're following your social media, they'll see just how active uh, your library is. So while the number of social media options can seem to be too many, overwhelming, and cumbersome, we as school librarians need to make the time to celebrate our libraries, celebrate our students, celebrate our teachers, and celebrate all the great library connections we've made. So use the various forms of social media meet viewers where they are, not where we necessarily want to be. Because remember, it's not about you. So even though I didn't know anything about Snapchat, I knew that since I was in the high school setting, if I wanted to reach the kids, I needed to start using that at the high school setting. So um, <laughs> I had some kids show me how to use it. And I was like, how do I get it to do this? How do I get it to do that? So um, don't ever be afraid to learn new things. There's our little Snapchat. All right, virtual hall, hallway. When I left the library, I left the library for a year and became an instructional technology facilitator or coach in an elementary school. While my teachers there were concerned that they couldn't hang student work out in the hallway because the work they were now doing was in digital format. 
So what I did to solve this problem is I used the website builder Weebly and I created a virtual hallway so that students could put their work um, they were making in iMovies, Google Slide presentations, scratch coding games, um, student created ebooks, and more could be displayed on that virtual hallway for parents to view. And I actually think we need to be doing something like this, not just for student work in digital format, but for all students, for all of our students individually. I see a virtual hallway as the first introductions to building individual digital portfolios. And this is a picture of Daniel Witt. He's the Instructional Technology Coordinator for Madison City Schools and has created a wonderful video detailing the importance of student digital portfolios and has also made all of his resources open source by the Madison City Schools website. Um, in my, the school system I just retired from, Every child grades three all the way to seniors are required to have a digital portfolio and to constantly be working and updating that portfolio. And I think it's something we need as educators as well. Um, I know for myself, keeping up my digital portfolio has helped me with teacher evaluations. So whenever I have to um, show evidence of work or something within that teacher evaluation, I can easily go to my digital portfolio and pull up what it is I've been doing and kind of cuts down on all those worries. But with digital portfolios, it teaches students to self-reflect and be masters of their own learning and compare their work from earlier in the year to what they're doing now and decide what's my better work. What's that digital footprint I want to put out to the world? And we're not just teaching digital citizenship because we have to check it off and so we put them in front of a computer and let them go through like a common sense, uh, which common sense is great, but we're teaching them in real life related to them in a way they see it as a personal thing, why they need to have a positive digital footprint. Seesaw, I see um, Rachel put that on there, my grandson's teacher. Um, a kindergarten teacher this year used Seesaw, and I love that we were able to see his work there. But his teacher in school also used Twitter to share out what they were doing as well. So um, all those different resources, I think, are important. So blog. All right, we had a kind of a split in the vote earlier about who's blogging. I love reading other librarian and educator posts on social media about what they're doing in their libraries. But these quick images with 140 character explanations often leave me wanting more information so that I can implement similar things in my school. Social media avenues like Facebook groups, Twitter posts, Instagram updates, and Snapchat all get lost in the stream. Trying to go back and find that great idea is often an impossible task as searching on some of these sites like in your Facebook groups is almost impossible. Blogging in more detail about the thing you're sharing on social media helps out your fellow librarian community. Really, please, blog, because when you share stuff in a Facebook group and I see all that stuff going on in the Facebook groups, I'm like, oh, did you write a blog post about this? Because uh, I'm not going to see it again. And how can I get back to this great information and all the, all the stuff that people are adding to your post in, in the Facebook group or on Twitter, and I'm not going to have any of that to go back to. It's so hard to find. So I believe that one of the most unselfish acts we can do for our students, teachers, parents, and fellow educators is to tell our story beyond the social media sound bites. We need to do that too, but we need to make it a little more deep and in-depth. I can't even begin to express the gratitude I feel towards educators like Andy Plemons, Gwyneth Jones, Joyce Valenza, Tiffany Whitehead, Alyssa Malaspino, Jennifer Lagarde, and so many more that take the time to blog and share their experiences, the good, the bad, and the ugly, because we need to know it all. In addition to the assistance your blog brings to others, blogging is also a great, great way for you to continuously reflect on your own professional development and learning. For some reason, once we finish our student teaching or inter internship and we get our own classroom or library, we stop reflecting on our own professional practice. 
honest reflection of our own practice should be the driving factor behind writing a blog, not whether anyone will ever read your blog. When I first started blogging, I was like, really? I can't write and nobody's going to want to read what I have to say. But, y'all, it's a great way to go back each year and remind yourself what you did and when you did it with what teacher and what grade level. And it's really honestly that reflection on your own professional practice. And if you look at it that way, then you're going to win. So one year I made it a point to write a blog post outlining what had happened in the library that week. Every week I was going, it was called This Week in the Library at. And so often at the end of the week I'd sit down and be like, geez, I haven't really done anything this week. I've got nothing to write in my blog. And then I'd start looking back through the calendar and I'd start looking back through the pictures I had taken that week and go, oh, <laughs> uh, I really did do a lot of stuff. And so we really have a way of underestimating the things that we've accomplished. And part of writing that blog helps us to realize what all we are doing and the activities we're doing to bring life to our libraries. And if you've never seen this video that I have up on the screen right now, the video is called Obvious to You, Amazing to Others. And it says we're clearly bad judges of our own abilities. So make sure to watch this video if you're still hesitating on blogging because I really think if you look at it as it doesn't matter if anybody reads this or not, but it's a, a reflection and it's a way to share in more detail what you're doing so others can learn, then I think you're going to change your mind about blogging. It has been well worth the time for me. All right, and then five, our very last tip for new librarians is to be, be fearless. I know it's hard, right? Be fearless even if you're trembling on the inside. Be the one who demonstrates that it's okay not to know something, but be willing to learn, fail, and start again. Two years ago, I finally found an innovative school that not only wanted, to, wanted but supported the innovative projects I wanted to bring to the school. Specifically, maker spaces. I'd seen all my friends doing it, so of course I wanted to do it, and <laughs> genreification of the book collection. Although I had never done either of these things, makerspaces or genre finding a book collection, I threw myself into the work. I relied heavily on the blog post from my PLN, my professional learning network, and what they had written on the topic. And so I reached out to them, I searched their blog post, I connected with them through Twitter and other social media resources. I ordered a 3D printer even though I knew nothing about 3D printing. Uh, when a student asked me to get Raspberry Pi for the makerspace, I said, oh, sure, that sounds delicious. And um, during our code this past December, I was really so scared because our cybersecurity teacher, the kids who know how to blog and hack into the system, things I have no idea how to do, um, she had signed them up to learn coding from me, and I was like, are you serious? <laughs> I know how to find HTML and copy and paste it, but that's pretty much all I know how to do. But what was so fun is that was probably one of the best classes I had during our code week because we were able to learn from each other, and that was so cool to do that. So I just let go of that fear and walked in anyway. Now I did feel like I was going to throw up that day because I was nervous, but I did it anyway is the point. <laughs> we need to model for both our students and our teachers the willingness to not know everything and the need not to control everything. My basic mode of operation was to let the students show me what to do with the new makerspace equipment. And this built a sense of pride and student ownership of the makerspace itself because again, it wasn't my makerspace. It's their maker space. And then genrefying the library collection, the fiction part of it, was something else I tasked my high school students to do. I let them de decide on the genres. I let them separate the books into genre stacks. I let them label the books. I let them arrange the books on the shelves. And I had them make the necessary changes to the library automation system. Again, all ownership of genrefying the library was student-centered and student-created. I also like to think of our job as librarians as matchmakers. So teachers are so busy with lesson planning, grading, wrangling kids, meetings, 
and their personal lives that there's little time for making valuable connections for collaboration. Since we as school librarians know all the teachers in our school and what they are teaching, it's easy for us to connect teachers who are teaching similar content for in-house collaborative opportunities. But then we also need to assist our teachers with expanding collaboration beyond the school building to forge authentic real-world learning opportunities with others across the country and around the world using video conferencing tools like Google Hangouts, YouTube Live, and Skype. Events like Read Across America, World Read Aloud Day, Andy Plemons' picture book Smackdown, Alyssa Malaspino's virtual debate, Stony Evans' Stony Stories empowered students to be to do in-house PD for the teachers and also be national presenters. National Poetry Month and Poem in Your Pocket Day, Mystery Skype, and so many more events can be made more can be made exponentially better by connecting with other schools celebrating or doing the same thing. I love that Shannon Miller put together a Google document this past year where we can all share monthly library celebrations, any of which could be made collaborative. All you have to do is reach out and ask. Stop sitting back waiting for someone else to invite you in. Stop sitting back waiting for someone else to say, hey, do you want to collaborate on this? You start reaching out and you start collaborating. It's just that easy. This community of teacher librarians is so supportive that if you ask, they are there and they will help you and they will have your back. And if they don't, contact me and I'll help connect you with somebody. All right. Um, so part of being fearless is knowing too that failure will happen. If you're using technology at all, guess what? It's going to fail. Uh, the second time I tried to do Hour of Code, of course, so many people were on the Hour of Code site that the site crashed. And there I am with day a day-long activity with different classes and no um, computers to be able to do Hour of Code. But you know what? <laughs> I went with it, and we figured out some... Um, coding activities that could be done without tech. And so you just have to be okay with that. And here's the, here's the key. 90% of all computer or device issues can be solved by completely shutting down the device and starting it back up. Not putting it to sleep, not restarting, but a complete shutdown and a complete restart. That solves 90% of your problems. And then, you know what, if that doesn't work, then just wing it. That's what we do as educators. Failure happens, and you should expect it to happen and be okay with that and have a little backup plan. And if you don't, man, don't sweat it. <laughs> you know, figure it out and have the kids say, well, you know what, that's not working. I wonder what we can do now. And let them help you come up with some things. Fear is a liar. Don't believe it. You have to come overcome that fear and just jump off that cliff, even if you don't know what's below you, and know that this wonderful library community is going to help you out. Um, part of being fearless is stepping out and trying new things, even if you've never tried them before. And the willingness to learn and put yourself out there, even if failure ensues, and it will, is the most fearless thing you can do. And recently I heard, um, and I can never say her name right, Gabourey <laughs> She, I heard her on a um, radio program being interviewed about her new book. And I think this is true for so many of us. We see rock star librarians or superstar educators and we think, geez, they, you know, they're so confident. I wonder how they do that. But y'all, just like Gabby said, I have to put my confidence on multiple times a day. It's like lipstick. You know what I mean? Lipstick, you wear off. Confidence wears off too. Sanity will wear off. You have to work at it. And you have to put it on every day. And there's days I have to wake up and force myself out of bed. There's times where I know a certain class is coming and I have to, you know, I've got to push that confidence on. Or where somebody comes in and says something to me that just, you know, hit below the belt because people will do that sometimes. And I've got to shrug that off and put that confidence back on. And it's knowing that every single one of us 
have tough times. I'm, I'm telling you, I've called different friends and we've cried together, we've laughed together, we've celebrated together, we've complained together. And that's what this library community is. And together, though, we help pull each other up. And if I have to have, you know, Alyssa strap my confidence on for me because I'm having a really de hard day putting it on myself, I know that she's out there and will help me with that as well. So know that it's something we all have to work at every single day. Here's some other resources of great blog posts that have already been written on tips for new school librarians. And I'm going to pass it over for questions. Thanks so much, Nikki. I was able to capture a few that you didn't answer. Yeah, I wasn't paying too much attention over here, yeah. chat. <laughs> you did catch, catch a few of them, though. Uh, somebody mentioned Remind. Would that work as well? Remind and Seesaw as well, as far as collaboration um, tools or portfolio sure. tools? Yeah. I mean, whatever portfolio tool you want, what we do and, well, in my former district before I retired, we used either Wix or Weebly, but mm -hmm. because at the high school level we had so many high school kids who could write their own code, right. that we told them, if you feel like you're more advanced than that and you want to use a more advanced website builder, use what feels comfortable to you because a, a digital portfolio is something that's going to live, breathe, and grow with that student for the rest of their entire life. Mm -hmm. And reminds really for communication purposes, not right. so much portfolios. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is Seesaw more of an elementary focus? I think it is. I, that's usually where I hear about it being used, and it's mm -hmm. also password protected. But mm -hmm. also with Weebly, you can password protect um, your pages as well, mm -hmm. so that only the the people that you share that password with can see that work. So it it all depends on what you want to use. I see someone mention Google Classroom. That's great too. Mm -hmm. But um, I like uh, I like a digital portfolio platform that can go with the kids once they leave school, once right. they graduate. And what platform did you? You said Weebly, so that was Weebly the platform you used for. Okay. I I prefer to use Weebly myself just because it's so easy. It's mm -hmm. you know easy drag and drop. You mentioned that that library celebration calendar. Is is that a yes. resource that's in the Live Finder, or where would somebody find that? Um, if it's not in the Live Finder, um, I have a blog post that is mm -hmm. going to post in about five minutes that okay. has all of this in there as well. Oh, okay, with great. Yeah, mm -hmm. great. Um, how much time do you spend coordinating with classroom teachers for? library curriculum integration and where you fit in meetings and how often? How I know often that's the problem, <laughs> yeah. right? Because if you're on a fixed schedule and you've got kids coming in every 50 mm -hmm. minutes and you only have time to scarf down lunch and run to the bathroom and go check your mailbox, where do you have time for that? So it really is a, a scheduling issue and how are you going to do that? And one thing that I've seen that Andy Plemons does is he models things that he wants to use with teachers and he makes mm -hmm. what he's doing in his library so interesting that instead of the teachers just dropping the kids off, they want to stay and see what he's doing. Mm -hmm. And then because they stay and want to see what he's doing, then they start saying, well, how could I do this in my classroom? Is this something I could do in my classroom? So I think the easiest way to get teachers on board is to simply start modeling it and getting your kids talking about it sharing out on social media what you're doing, and then I have teachers contact me saying, hey, I saw you did this in the library. I'd really like to do something similar to this in my classroom. Can you meet with me? Mm -hmm. So, you know, trying to force it isn't going to work, but modeling right. so that they come to you is um, will work much better. Terrific. Terrific, Nikki. Those were the questions that I was able to capture. Um, that Nikki hadn't answered during her presentation. If anyone else has questions, you can type them in chat. And if you have a question later, you can always hit me up on Twitter or mm -hmm. Facebook or anywhere you see me. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I saw my friend from Argentina. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, that seems to be it for the questions. Again, thanks so much. And Thank you. I really line. appreciate it. And I'm going to turn the mic over to Peggy now, who will tell us what's coming up next. Thank you so much, Nikki. That was great. And it was great advice for all of us, regardless of whether we're librarians or classroom teachers or whatever our role is. Thanks a lot for sharing with us. And we hope you'll all come back next Saturday, because it's our last webinar before summer break. And it is going to be so much fun. We're going to have an open mic show all about what's on your summer bucket list. Paula Nagel is going to facilitate for us. And it can be personal or professional, but think about something that you'd love to share with other people in our group. Come and get on the microphone and tell us what you're excited about for this summer. And that will be next Saturday, and then we'll be taking a break. And we won't have any shows from June 24th through August 5th. August 5th, we'll be back with a fabulous new season. So thank you all for joining us today. The Learning Revolution Project is Steve Hargadon's latest. He's gathered all his PD resources in one place, including host your own webinar, where you can sign up for a collaborate session. And as long as you make the session public, it is free. You can nominate a featured teacher, as Nikki was today, uh, by filling out the form here or the form in the live binder in the resources section. You can nominate yourself as well. The video collection is in iTunes U. And as you exit the session today, the survey link should open up in your browser, or you can take the link in chat or in from the live binder as well. And once you complete the survey, you can request a professional development certificate. It now prints out your name, thanks to Patty Russing, and Patty also sends them out. Make sure you, re if you request this, you have your personal email address for the recipient. Schools tends to block these from getting to you. Special thanks to Nikki Robertson, to Steve Hargadon, founder of Classroom 2.0, Future of Education, and the Learning Revolution to Blackboard Collaborate for our webinar platform and everyone who participated in the show today. Thanks so much for coming.